Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core peer learning circle, part of a series about evaluation. Thank you. These peer learning circles are a different format from usual core coffee chats. They're more of a conversation where we can all share tips and learn from each other. My name is Crystal Caballero, and I'm joined today by Jane Conklin. We are part of the consulting team, along with Nicole Young and Nicole Lezen, who support a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or CORE, Investments, and we will be your hosts today. We're joined today by our colleagues, Oscar Rios, providing simultaneous interpretation, and Chisela Carrasco, providing consecutive interpretation and translation in the chat. In case anyone is new to CORE, we'll provide a brief overview. CORE, which stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, is a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. CORE has evolved over several years based on input and insights gathered from many partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups. This collaborative process has led to the core mission and vision with equity at the center. And when we say equitable health and well being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well being, and that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by their race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or other social identities. So as both a funding model and a movement, CORE provides a framework to align priorities, programs, policies, funding, and results around community-wide goals to create the core conditions for health and well-being. Equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs, practices, and structures that perpetuate the very inequities we are determined to eliminate. Events like today's Peer Learning Circle are offered as part of the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact, otherwise known as the CORE Institute. Think of the CORE Institute as the learning arm of CORE Investments, offering an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities for people across sectors to build the knowledge, skills, and systems needed to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. And with that, I'll pass it to Jane Conklin to lead us through our time today to discuss the key components of an evaluation plan. Great, thanks so much, Crystal. And it really is my pleasure to be here and to co-facilitate this peer learning circle with Crystal, Gisela, and Oscar. I'm really passionate about evaluation and I'm looking forward to meeting everyone today and having just a conversation about what people are interested in, what they've found works for them, any challenges that they may have. Um, so I'll tell you just a little bit about my background and then I'll invite um, people on the call to introduce themselves and to say, you know, what they're interested in talking about today. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm an independent consultant and um, I have been in practice, whoops, sorry, just lost my screen there, been in practice for about 10 years. Um, prior to that, I worked for a community foundation, several nonprofit service providers, and a state health department. And in each of those roles, I had some responsibility around evaluation or its close cousin um, monitoring. So those two sometimes go hand in hand. Um, I currently spend about half my time on program evaluation projects, and I really consider myself a student of evaluation. So I've done a lot of on-the-job training and workshops, attending conferences, as well as some more formal training um, in evaluation. And so I just wanted to get us started by those of you who signed up and decided to spend some of your time on this call. I wanted to find out a little bit about each of you and you know, um, I know uh, Josie's already introduced herself in the chat, but maybe I can ask um, 
uh, others on the call to just state their name, organization, and what they're, why they came to the call today. So who would like to get us started? Um, Liz or... I can start. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm Liz DePoit and I'm the Director of Safe Families for Children in Monterey Bay. Um, and I apologize if my Wi-Fi cuts out or is bad, I'm actually on vacation in Mexico right now, so <laughs> it's <laughs> off and on. But um, I'm very grateful to be here. And um, as far as what we want to learn today, I did tune in about 10 minutes late. So um, I don't know if I can answer that right now, but um, just any time I've joined a, a core discussion or even last year when our last round, we applied and, and weren't um, accepted, but just anything to learn more about it and how um, to you know strengthen my knowledge around all of that is appreciated. Great, thank you. And then Nora, are you still on the call? Oops, she may have dropped off, it looks like. And then Josie, I know you said in the chat that you were here to gain some more knowledge and connect with others. Is there anything that you'd want to add to that? Any specific issues you're interested in? Um, not that I could think of at the moment. Um, just, you know, I, I'm just curious to hear where the topics lead. I don't have anything in mind in specific, but I, I always like to join these uh, meetings and just hear from everyone else and and um, yeah, I, that's it for now. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, thank you again, both of you for attending. Um, and so we, I prepared just a couple little slides to set the stage um, and then, you know, have some open-ended questions and, you know, there's more in more slides if we, if we want to go that route, but again, really wanting to have uh, a conversation um, focused on things that you're interested in. I also wanted to point out, Crystal is also practicing consultant, practicing evaluation, and she's embarking on a new project. So she may have some, some questions and things to share as well. Is there anything you want to add, Crystal, before I dive into some slides? I think let's get started. Thanks, Jane. Okay. Um, all right. So I prepared a slide and just really basic kind of uh, starting out with an evaluation definition. And then we had talked about um, the this learning circle really is focused on planning. So I have a slide about that as well. But, you know, there are a million definitions out there around evaluation. Um, some are quite academic in nature or complex. Um, this is one that I really like. Um, it, um, and it's really about this, I, I, there's a couple of reasons I like it, but this idea of any systematic process. So it has some intentionality. It's around assessing uh, the judging the merit, worth or significance. So when we think of evaluation, value is right at the heart of that word. And then um, this idea by combining evidence and values. So I think um, this one in particular, because it adds that notion of values, um, I think that's really very appropriate and aligns well with core. So for core, having equity at the center, we can also build that right into our evaluation, ideas around equity and inclusion in all sorts of ways, whether it's the process of engaging stakeholders in the evaluation, how we think about program outcomes for the program that we're looking at, um, how we frame evaluation questions, collect evidence, what counts as evidence, how we interpret and share results. So I think that particular definition kind of is a very rich one um, in terms of thinking about evaluation. And I think the other thing I would add just personally is this idea of evaluation can also just be sort of evaluative thinking and this way of really looking at programs and trying to understand them. Um, I think when I started my career and working in evaluation, it was kind of sometimes very complicated and intimidating. And so I think just kind of inviting curiosity as well is really important. Um, do you folks have any initial thoughts about that? Uh, I, that definition of evaluation, or do you think of it differently? Um,
Okay, so then let's move on. Um, the next slide, thank you. Um, this is a program model. Um, so this is a framework. It's actually one that was developed by CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And it was really designed around um, public health program evaluation. But I think it's really a, a scalable, flexible model that can be applied to just about any um, setting. And I will confess, when I was at the beginning of my career, evaluation work happened at the agencies where I worked. It was very piecemeal. It might have been a thing that we were trying to fit in on top of a thousand and one other tasks, or maybe it just happened when we had a new program or kind of trying to keep our funders happy at the end of a program. And so the benefits of taking a more structured and sequenced approach, I think is a really critical lesson I learned kind of throughout my evaluation experience. And so I like this particular framework because it's very sequential and it kind of gets me thinking, especially at the beginning of an evaluation or the beginning of my time, you know, I've had that experience of being kind of dropped in the middle of evaluations that were already underway. And so even kind of coming back to this sort of logical sequence of steps to try and navigate that complexity, I think is helpful. And so today we really want to focus kind of on the earlier parts of our discussion, or we can take it any place in this <laughs> sequence that you like. But in this particular model, you know, it starts out with engaging stakeholders. So it's that idea of, for example, who are the evaluation primary users, who are the people that are running the program, who are program participants, and finding ways, you know, to kind of check in with those individuals or those groups around maybe planning the evaluation. And here it's a little artificial showing it up front. It can happen throughout the cycle. There may be opportunities for people to help with um, developing data collection tools or making sense of findings or reporting all of those things. But it, it is kind of a part of evaluation to really think about who are your stakeholders, who are your users, who's affected by the evaluation. And then this next step around um, describing the program. So making sure that everybody who's part of the process is really clear about um, what, what it is that you're evaluating. It can be surprising, I think, sometimes in that process when you have discussions with even people implementing the program, they may have very different ideas about what are the program components and what is it intended to accomplish. So, you know, it might be helpful to either develop a logic model or theory of change if your agency doesn't have it for the particular program or to revisit it in the evaluation, just to kind of make sure everybody's on the same page. The goals are clearly described and any constructs that are in there, like, I don't know, people might talk about increasing capacity, you know, what does that mean? Or they might talk about, you know, we want to empower you know our participants to do this that or the other thing so it's really important up front in an evaluation or at some point when you're before you're really collecting data to make sure you understand those elements um, and this third step around focusing the design that might be identifying those priority evaluation questions what is it that you want to know identifying the data collection strategies that are going to let you answer those questions developing those timelines for collecting data, analyzing it, reporting, and so forth. And then once you've kind of accomplished all of those planning process processes, it's getting to the heart of evaluation, you know, gathering data, evidence that's going to work to answer your questions, that's credible for your stakeholders, and justifying your conclusions. And then finally, the important piece around ensuring that data are used and that you're able to share lessons learned. I sometimes think about like, that's the gold standard for evaluation, right? Are your findings used? And there's ways to kind of build in increasing that probability throughout the evaluation. So that's kind of the, the model that I feel like I find really helpful to sort of touch in on that, it, depending on the size of the evaluation. Sometimes I do it really formally. Other times it's a little bit more organic to the process. Um, but I did want to share that, you know, maybe to kind of stimulate some ideas and conversations. 
do other people on the call use have a framework that they like or use to guide their evaluations? Um, I'm not sure if this is what you're getting at, but um, we, when we bring new family referrals in, um, we do an initial evaluation of, you know, where they feel they are on multiple categories. And then we do a midpoint um, reassessment of that as they're, you know, approximately halfway through the time they feel they need safe families. And then we do one at the end. Um, we're a local chapter of a national organization, so they also do a huge, much more deeper dive into that at the national level and evaluate that all for us. Um, but that's, you know, one of the ways that we've tracked our, you know, impact um, to, to make sure that we're, you know, learning um, exactly in the areas that we're trying to focus on and, and make an impact. And then um, we've also in recent years had um, a pretty large um, study done through a few universities on safe families. And so that went way deep into it. I was not a part of that, but I find it really interesting, um, you know, all the extended um, pieces of it that go together when a larger um, evaluator, right, is, is conducting thorough research for many, many years. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting hybrid of there's kind of the internal individual level work that you're doing with your families. And then it kind of it sounds like you also have support, um, maybe to aggregate some of those data, look at them. Um, and then is there um, I, I would also be interested, I don't want to take this too far into that Jane's like interested in this question, but you know, do when you get do you get information back from those the national level evaluators? And then are there particular ways you use that in your program? Um yes, we have received um that the data ended about it's about a five-year study and it ended about a year ago. And um it was done through our or our Illinois chapter and um joined with uh, Family Children's Services and Protective Services there. Um, and so, yeah, the data was super, um, you know, informational about how many fewer children are entering foster care as a result. That's our, that's our mission is to prevent child abuse and neglect and reduce the need for foster care placement. Um, while strengthening parents really is, is the, the overarching mission. And so we, found that that it was you know a staggering amount of children that were being deflected and so um yeah they they did gather all that and it's now evidence-based um yeah yeah that's really nice to hear you know that sounds to me like very much like it's definitely a program success story but it's also an evaluation success story because it really illuminates you know what's working well and maybe um that can also be really, uh, I think, has important benefits for staff too to kind of know, yeah. <laughs> you know, that that what they're doing is making that difference. Yeah, but then kind of like you were saying too, at our local level, right? You know, how are, we're much, of course, smaller entity than the entire state of Illinois, and so how how is our impact here also um, being tracked by our by our um, evaluation steps? And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Josie or Crystal, any thoughts about a framework or ways that you approach um, evaluation planning in particular or other pieces, um, things that work really well for you, <laughs> challenges? Um, I, I, it's similar to what Liz said, like internally we have, um, you know, in our program, we do an evaluation at the time of um like entering the programs that we offer. Um, then we have like a midterm evaluation and then a final one. So there's families we work with for like six months and um, that's how we capture some of the information. Um, some of the challenges 
we do have is just the um, population we deal with um, and how comfortable they are with some of the questions or um, just um, they're not very they're not very personal, but um, they do require a lot more support and feeling out. Um, or we try to do it in person, um, the evaluations, just because um, if we'll ask for them, um, we don't have a lot of people that will submit them. Um, so we have to just offer extra support and do more in person. And um, I think that's an inch, that's definitely like that challenge of, you know, trying to collect data, trying to collect useful mm -hmm. data and, and like, um, you know, there needs to be some rapport and trust with people to be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes it can also be a challenge maybe when, you know, of how much control you have over the questions, you know, to mm -hmm. ask, like, are those questions given to you? Do you ever have any discussions about, you know, are all questions equally useful? Are all questions easy to ask? Do they, you know, that kind of, um, because I think sometimes there can be a disconnect between what the evaluator wants and what the program staff is mm -hmm. able to do and where the client is feeling comfortable. Does that yeah. ever come up for, or has it come up for other people? I, I've seen that. that. I have seen that um, before. Yes. And it's easier um, to collect versus like gaining that trust as well. Um, when we have uh, some of our participants, we have a longer term with like over six months, but some of these um, participants are maybe like a month. So it just depends on the program and then building that trust um, and working with them throughout the, the time frame. It's it's easier to get um, information from our participants once we've worked with them longer, if it makes sense. And yeah. um, I feel like it has to do a lot with trust too. And, um, you know, sometimes some of our programs, we've had people say like, what's the catch? Like, I, this sounds like a scam or something like that. So it's just, you know, building trust. It's definitely very, um, at least important for us or something that I've seen. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's also that, you know, if I would bring it back to kind of the planning piece, you, you said something that's really important. It's like the, the when you collect data really makes a difference, you know? So if it's something that you're, you know, that can go into planning and evaluation Design. So that might be something that you learn, you know, in the course of service delivery about when you're going to get the best information. I think there can also be, um, you know, some techniques depending on how you ask the question of, you know, if you're wanting to see change over time, you know, sometimes evaluators are like, oh, I want a pretest or, you know, kind of understanding what's happening at the very beginning and then compare it to, you know, at the end of the program. But if you can't get that reliable information at the beginning, you might need to get creative and, you know, kind of ask people to think back to at the beginning of the program and what's changed for them, um, you know, those kind of strategies. But there's also a little bit, oh, Crystal has a question. So <laughs> I'll stop there. Go ahead, Crystal, or comment wants to chat. I'll stop. I did not mean to interrupt you, Jane. You want oh, to finish? No, no worries. I was just getting, I get so excited. So it's really mm -hmm. good to hear another voice. <laughs> Thanks. I was thinking about that too, just the the trust building piece and being cautious of over surveying folks, especially working with vulnerable populations. And I had a follow up question for you, Josie, because in, in the trust building, like let's say, or you know, you've done surveying and kind of done follow up. In my experience, I, I just try to be honest with folks. In the past, I used to work for the food bank, for example, and every year annually, we had to do like a demographic survey and like report that to the federal um, funders. And when I was administering that survey, I was just honest with them. And I said, hey, this is just super honest. And I wonder, is that everyone's approach? And how do we communicate sort of like a capitalism <laughs> viewpoint of like data collection and evaluation and, and in to people who, yeah, to vulnerable populations and also 
being cautious of over surveying or like tokenism. I don't know if I'm making sense, but I, I wonder how folks grapple with that. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Um, we are very uh, transparent and communicate of why we collect certain um, data and, and they totally understand. Um, but it just still does, I think some um, of, yeah, like our population still deals with um, trusting no matter what. Like I've seen that, um, you know, they don't, they, um, and especially when we're like, hey, if, you know, for joining, you're going to get like a stipend of this much and we're going to work with you for six months. And they still feel like, well, what's the catch? Like there has to be a catch to this, right? So I, I know at the beginning we do come across maybe like, they're like, just like, oh, well, I don't know about this. Like there's going to the trust, but eventually we do build that trust. Like we've learned how to work with them. We're very transparent of why we're collecting certain data, you know, like the demographics and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a learning lesson for us. And, and we're also very um, mindful of the, um, just the culture that we're, you know, that we're dealing with, very sensitive to like backgrounds and mindful of that and how we can approach that. Yeah, that's um, similar. Several of the things you've said, Josie, are very similar to what we experience. It takes trust. And um, when we're doing our initial one, you know, it's, of course, to to learn more about them and, and what their most significant needs are and their history. But also, I appreciate what you said, Crystal, that, you know, to be very honest, and this really helps us with our program, right? Because we want to learn how to do what will we do better and um, see if what Safe Families does is is impacting our communities. And I think that really speaks to them you know, at times, and it feels good for, for them to give info that might be helping future families. Um, and yes, sometimes the initial intake is so crisis-based that you really don't have time to sit down and ask them all these personal evaluative questions. I mean, we hear their story and we do all of that, but then it does, it takes time to go through the survey. And so maybe we pause take a breath well, and then revisit it and say, okay, let's think back to the day you entered our program, right? And how might you answer these questions? Because we don't want to be forceful with that that's a requirement um, before starting. You know, we have our paperwork and our legal pieces that we need to situate before they receive support. But um, we try and be very flexible with with the situation that they're going through, depending on the level of crisis. And, um, oh shoot, what else were you, there was something else um, I thought you asked that I had an answer for, but I can't remember. <laughs> Well, that was, I was busy taking notes on, on what you both were saying and I feel very complete, so thank you. I have a follow-up question and I think it was triggered a little bit by something you said, Liz, about um, something along the lines of, you know, kind of helping improve the program. I think sometimes it can be a little bit tricky. You know, you want people to be um very honest with you around, you know, what you can do better or what might not be working so well. Um, I think my instinct is sometimes like that can be hard for people to, especially when they're really appreciative of, you know, maybe the service, like to get that kind of more constructive or critical or even negative feedback. And so are there ways that you kind of make that also acceptable? Um, for people, or is, is that not necessarily a challenge that you encounter? Um, I don't think that we have really encountered that, but the, the families do also have the opportunity to fill it out on their own, and then they could, you know, send it to our staff who enters it into our database um, without me seeing it, you know, if they had concerns like that, that they didn't want to offend by giving criticism, right, or, or critique or whatever, um, 
we could we could be sensitive to that, right? So if we were sensing that from a parent, um, that could be an opportunity to to do that. But um, I haven't, I don't, you know, I haven't um, had an instance where I felt like that had been a issue, really. Yeah, and I think sometimes, you know, that that an anonymous option or or more confidential, maybe um, that can be really helpful. Um, I think, you know, the the stating the why, you know, you're collecting. I mean, sometimes if it's like we're collecting it for a funder, that can be a little bit <laughs> of a of a kind of a little bit uh, maybe introducing a little bias into the process. Um, so it might be, you know, kind of, I think sometimes reassuring. I know when I do um, like focus groups, you know, I always <laughs> talk about like program improvement and we want to hear, you know, diversity of opinions and different um, ideas around um, what, what the program can do better to serve, you know, other people. Um, so I do think sometimes kind of setting that stage and kind of reminding people they're not going to lose services for, um, you know, whether they elect not to participate in an evaluation, you know, it's always voluntary, at least the ones that I've done. I don't know. I think that's also really important. And I would imagine in most cases, participation in the evaluation, I'm hoping in all cases, it's voluntary. Um, but um you know, I think kind of letting people know that they have the, the right not to participate if they don't want to. Um, there may be ways to time that so that you kind of increase participation um, and ways to frame it so that you aren't just kind of unintendedly, you know, encouraging people not to participate. But um, I think, you know, making sure to try and kind of level the playing field for people and kind of that power differential is really important to pay attention to um, in collecting data. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, I remember now what I was going to say that actually goes along with that point is that um, we're about 95% volunteer fueled. So we have a very small staff and then all, you know, the, the immediate touch points that surround these families with support are volunteers. And I think that's what I have always felt is a huge part of our success is that the families know these are just kind people wanting to offer them um, whatever they can, um, to support them going through their crisis. And so that I think they know they're not like, if they filled out our evaluation, it's not that their volunteer is going to lose their job for not doing their job well, or we're going to close our doors, right? This is just something of a volunteer, you know, is wanting to communicate so that they gather helpful information. Um, of course it goes to our you know, database for our national program, but um, it's it's a volunteer relationship. And I think that probably makes it feel more comfortable for families. Yeah, I think that those are great points. And I'm, I'm kind of, as we're talking, you know, I'm thinking about like that whole evaluation plan or when you plan to collect data, you know, sometimes we talk about like, like the informed consent piece and kind of making sure your consent is like clear, people understand, you know, the implications of, you know, uh, their participation, it's voluntary, no one's gonna lose their job, you're not gonna lose program funding. And then how their data are used, I think is also really important, you know, we kind of, you know, if they're the, the level of confidentiality they might expect, um, you know, and, and things are aggregated, they're not identifying and, and sort of how they're used. I think those are really important pieces. And I think, you know, in my tying it back into the design piece is kind of working out some of those issues up front, um, I think is really important. And I think that um, kind of that access to data, I know um, sometimes like in the work that I do, I'll, we'll have, you know, the funder of the evaluation, I'm collecting data with a participant. And if I want, um, 
I kind of want to make sure clear up front, like those data are confidential in a particular way to the evaluation team, because I want people to be really candid and I don't want them to think, oh, <laughs> so it's really important in the design phase to negotiate with all the stakeholders, like the funders, the, the managers of the evaluation, just like where the data reside and how they're safeguarded so that you can be really transparent in how you communicate that to your participants and everybody's on board. What other questions or are there particular, are there any questions people are kind of struggling with around evaluation that they want to talk about? Um, or any successes, things that they're like, this is amazing. I really thought I did this. I worked through this, this process and, uh, you know, created this fabulous evaluation plan or executed a, a great evaluation. I do have a question, Jane, if this is the right time. Sure. So... One of the things that I'm also trying to grapple with is the balance between a whole evaluation plan and doing it really formally and doing the whole big, really nicely laid out step-by-step -step funded evaluation versus more of a piecemeal approach, which, would, which I think would be appropriate if there's capacity issues or limitations in funding. How, I just wonder, do you have experience like navigating that um, and advice around that? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. I actually have um, like components of an evaluation plan. I am a big fan of a plan and a written plan. I think it really, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be super elaborate. I think um, the pieces that I find really essential are, um, I don't know if you wanna scroll ahead to that slide. I can't remember which, I think it's toward the end of these. There's our discussion, tips keep going. Um, it's here. So um, even though there's a lot, <laughs> I've kind of bolded the pieces that I think are really important. I. Um, So, but I think all the pieces you can sort of, so the introduction is one that sometimes you can almost, you can, is, is sort of describing what you're evaluating, um, the purpose of the evaluation. Um, and that sometimes you can lift that right from a grant application. <laughs> you know, if it's like, this is a program that was designed, is funded by this agency designed to do this, you know, if, if it's that kind of program, right? So, and sometimes, and then you might be like, you know, they've hired an external evaluator or we're doing, you know, a mixed method internal event, whatever it is. And sometimes that introduction is something that then you can repurpose when you're doing your evaluation report. It's kind of like right there for you. So I don't know that it's, you know, it's some investment upfront to kind of think through what's the program, what's the purpose of the evaluation. And then you can do a more detailed program description if you want, but if you don't want having like the logic model or theory of change that really clearly lays out at some level, you know, what are the program components? What are the intended outcomes, whether that's short, medium, longer term to just kind of make sure you're really clear on what the value and what it is you're evaluating. And this piece I find it just so helpful because <laughs> the number of times where I've been, you know, as an evaluator and it's like people have very different ideas, whether it's, you know, the leadership who's not delivering the program versus the program deliver. Sometimes those are very different notions. So it's nice to have a clear description. Um, I think a couple, two or three evaluation questions are really helpful to have up front because they can really keep you from disciplined and not kind of drifting off into <laughs> other things that are nice to know, but maybe not necessary to know. So if you're like, 
we want maybe a process piece around how well did we deliver, you know, the trainings where they delivered with fidelity to the curriculum or whatever, or, um, you know, did we serve the people that we intended to serve, like something really simple. Um, but then you may want some like outcomes. Did we achieve, you know, our short-term outcomes around, um, I can't remember the language you use, Liz, but around, you know, making sure that that kids are, um, I can't, I really can't remember the language. I'm sorry, I should have written it down. But anyway, you might want like two or three, like really useful evaluation questions that you're going to be able to use that information and having them written down, like then when you're deep in the weeds of like, oh, I'm designing a survey or a focus group guide that you can be like, is it giving me the evidence that's going to help me answer those questions that we've agreed upon? Because um, this may not happen all the time, but I feel like in my experience, anytime we're, you know, they're like, oh, let's ask the participants all these questions. I want to know about this, that, and the other thing. And they're just, as we talked about at the open of the call, you know, there's precious time with participants, you know, how much access and when is the appropriate time to access. You want to be really careful with that. So I think a brief intro, a logic model, some questions, and then even a little table that's like, these are the questions, these are the data sources that I'm going to use. That is a beautiful thing to have. <laughs> um, if there's anything that's like an outcome or, you know, key construct that is ambiguous, <laughs> you want to make sure you have that defined up front if you can. So I sometimes will, um, I think that's, that's time well spent. So if you're like, I don't know what kind of outcomes you're looking for, but again, like if you're like, I want to increase capacity or engagement or whatever it is, I think anything that you can define what that means, you know, I had a client that said, we want to talk about breaking down silos. <laughs> I'm like, what is a silo to you? How do we define that? What does it look like? What would it look like if it were, you know, broken down, like those kind of things. So I think like at the beginning, because then again, you can kind of do that work to design your tools to really explore those. Um, and I think there's a little bit, I know this sounds like a, a lot, <laughs> but a lot of it's like a short paragraph a visual, a table, you know, maybe some more pieces to it. And then finally, one more slide down. I think there's a couple more. Yeah, this can be in your table. I'm going to do focus groups at this particular point in time, whatever that is. Um, the analysis plan, again, maybe it's on a timeline. You know, the Gantt chart is a beautiful thing. <laughs> And I think that's, a, you know, that I would bullet out. So I will go back again and again to my timeline of when am I engaging my st stakeholders? When am I planning to develop my data collection tools? When am I launching those? When am I doing my analysis and reporting? And um, that last piece, I talked a little bit about the data security and confidentiality. I think another just key piece of a plan is where the data sits, <laughs> kind of who has access to it, uh, when you're going to uh, ultimately delete that data, if you delete it, you know, um, if you have recordings, for example, how do you attend to that? And again, who has access, the number of, I, I feel like, so important to state up front, because it has, has occurred more than once for me to have like a funder come back and be like, oh, we saw that you did a focus group. Can I have all the transcripts? And then you're like, well, we decided <laughs> this is the plan you signed off on. So sometimes it's just making all those things clear. So it seems like a lot, but I think you could do it in two pages. <laughs> Does that make sense? Is it helpful? It is helpful. Thank you. It's helping me remember to stay in integrity with what an evaluation really is and trying not to go outside of maybe best practices to do some data collection. That's what I think I, um, that's, I think the struggle, but I have and, so many questions, but I'm noticing your time as well. I mean, 
Oh, shoot. I get, I do get excited. But, you know, I think yeah. that's also such a, you know, oftentimes when we think of evaluation, we're thinking about data collection. You know, we run, brush right into methods first. And so that's the other reason why I like having a plan is, you know, what are my evaluation questions? Um, I think that use question is also really like what the purpose, like why are we collecting it? How are we going to use it? In some cases, um, you know, the use, like who's going to be making the decisions and what is credible evidence to them can be really important in shaping how you approach your data collection. So not every evaluation needs to be, have some kind of random control trial, right? Like it might be something that you can collect much more modest data, but useful data. And then, you know, use it to make important decisions like what what kind of decisions are you making and who who what what's going to be persuasive and that's again that stakeholder engagement at the beginning so that you're like okay we have the right mix of methods to answer our questions to provide credible evidence to the people who need it for decisions and so kind of tying that back to Josie and Liz's experience, you know, they, it sounds like they have like a lot of support around this, like confidence in those methods, you know, of the data that their staff and volunteers are collecting. And then they're getting it back in such a way that has, sounds like whether it's useful in adjusting the program or kind of sustaining staff as they kind of do the work that they do in understanding its purposes. So I think that sounds like a really nice loop in that those particular evaluations. Um, Josie or Liz, do you have thoughts about, or, or sorry, Crystal, did you have more that you wanted on that topic? Or I don't know, Josie and Liz, if you have thoughts about evaluation planning or other, we have about five minutes left. No, I, I don't. I'm just digesting everything. And, you know, um, thank you for sharing all this information. And I do have some tips if you want me to go through those. Um, I did a padlet if I can figure out how to share that with some, some different components. Um, Maybe shall we go back up to some of the things I think we've talked about? Um, Crystal, did you have other questions? I thought that was such a good one. <laughs> and I am such a fan of an evaluation plan. And I would say back when I was working for like the health department, we would have something that we'd submit with our um, application for our cooperative agreement. And then we kind of, it would sit there and then, you know, not a, I, I don't know, it wasn't as planful. And I feel like as I've gotten to more experience with written plans, even simple ones, I'm such a fan. Um, so this is the stakeholder engagement. I think we've talked about that. Um, you know, I think that second point around primary evaluation users, oftentimes that's interpreted as people who are going to make decisions based on what the evaluation, oh, there's my dog just came in, <laughs> on what the evaluation um, results are. So it's really important to keep those folks in the loop kind of throughout, especially at the beginning. Um, implementers, that's the staff who are doing the work. So um, I think like Josie, you were saying, like you've learned some things collecting data that are really important for evaluators to understand. Um, both Josie and Liz, you've talked about like how you establish rapport and, you know, time that and dealing with clients' most immediate needs first. So that's like, if an evaluator doesn't understand that, they're going to come up with a plan that is not going to work. And so it's, you know, that conflict between what's wanted outside and what's actually feasible and appropriate is really, and so you're not gonna get good data if you're not listening to your implementers, your staff, your volunteers, um, people who are, um, people you're serving or affected. Again, I think um, Jesse and Liz spoke really powerfully about how important it is to um, be mindful. Um, and sometimes, you know, there are ways, some agencies have advisory bodies, you know, where you can kind of get that input. Sometimes it might be indirect based again through, um, 
staff experience, or sometimes it might be more direct. There may be opportunities to do some pilot testing of tools, ask people for their help, maybe compensate them for that to kind of walk through, like I'm trying to figure out if this is useful and want your feedback. Um, so that's really great. And then if you're engaging stakeholders, just as the evaluation team, making sure you're clear about what your timeline is for that and how you make any final decisions. Next slide. And Crystal, do we need to leave a minute or two to wrap up? Okay, yes. so maybe I need to stop. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay. so there's, there's all, there's more here and the slides will be available, I think, um, after this call. And we also have, um, a Padlet, which is just a website with, um, some different resources that people can add to that. Um, and we can make that available, the link available to that as well. Okay. Thank you, Jane. So yeah, we will leave just a few minutes at the end for wrapping up. Jane does have a great slide. Do you wanna talk about these resources? Oh, okay. sure, okay, um, yes. So the first one on the left is that six step model that I talked through the CDC model. And there are many links to other pieces there. Um, the middle one is around these SMARTY goals. So that this classic SMART specific measurable, measurable, actionable, realistic, time-based, and adding the IE, um, inclusive and equity-based. Yes, I'm blanking. <laughs> um, and there are many resources out there. This, I really like this, this particular site because they have some worksheets and they also have a resource bank of sample goals. So that's new to some of us of adding that element in um, the equity and inclusion element. So that's a great resource. And then finally, I really like better evaluation for um, just lots of general background information. They gave that definition. If you're interested in any kind of method, you can go there, put that in, and they'll send you to a bunch of really useful resources. So they're they're a nice place too. Thank you. And thank you, Chisela. She's also dropping the links to those resources in the chat. And the slides will be available. It just takes a few days for us to get everything uploaded. Um, so we just wanna wrap up with a couple upcoming events. The next one will be a part, the last part of a three-part series for proposal prep with Nicole Young and Nicole Lezen. So more about evaluation theories of change and the magic of metrics. And I think that this was a great conversation today. Thank you so much, Jane, for sharing your expertise. And the good news is there's still two more opportunities to connect with Jane on evaluation. Um, so we have on May 8th, the program evaluation, data collection and analysis, diving more into that. And May 23rd, getting the most from your data and findings. And I could, I could say I'm personally really looking forward to those. So thank you, Jane. And we wanted to thank you all for being here today. So we do have two feedback surveys that Gisela will drop the link in the chat. If you could just take a moment to fill those out, it helps, uh, speaking of surveys, it helps us out a lot to understand if we are serving your needs and meeting your interests. Um, so you can complete it once you leave the Zoom meeting or scan the QR codes. Um, Gisela, thank you so much for all of your chat. Um, and thank you, Oscar, for your uh, support as well. And thank you all. We hope you great take great care and we will hope to see you next time.